start letting some folks in. Any 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 last behind the scenes stuff before I uh, open the floodgates? Open, Rama. Open. Unless Jeffrey's got something to add. Uh, I do, but you know, I'll save it for later. <laughs> Welcome folks just joining us, just waiting as, as people trickle in. Are you in Perth at the moment, Rama? I am. Oh, I am. it looks like it with those blinds. <laughs> is, that, is that a dead giveaway? <laughs> yeah, it is. Like you would have closed windows and glass. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, I think it's usually more obvious when 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 all you folks in Melbourne are wearing scarves and 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 beanies and and hoodies uh, on on a Zoom yeah. meeting. I'm wearing my singlet and <laughs> and board shorts. At least you haven't got the beach behind you or something just to tempt us. Oh, he's done that, Nicole. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the hoodie on. Just give it another minute, folks, before we kick off. All right, folks, thank you. And welcome. Um, firstly, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land which I am currently on, the Wajuk Noongar people, and pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to further acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that you are all situated on. Um, my name is Rama Agung Igusti and I'm a PhD candidate at Victoria University, um, but also part of the Community Identity and Displacement Research Network, or SIDRAN, uh, which hosts this series of seminars. Um, SIDRIN is a network of researchers engaged in investigating new diasporas and changing meanings of displacement and identity and asking new questions around such things as indigeneity, racism, forced migration, sense of place, social inclusion, social justice, transnationalism and xenophobia. So these seminars invite a range of transdisciplinary and transnational voices to engage in discussion across these different areas and share some of the valuable thinking and research uh, that folks are engaged in um, from different places uh, and, and different areas and, and institutes. So just a note that these sessions are, are recorded um, and being shared um, in, in other spaces uh, online and in social media places, just to, to let folks know as well. So, I would like to welcome you all to today's seminar, which is entitled Change Makers, Enhancing Social Inclusion for Migrants and Refugees in Sport in Melbourne's West. Uh, this seminar will introduce Change Makers, a collaborative program led by Victoria University's Sport and Social Change Living Lab in partnership with community organisations and local government and aims to drive systemic change toward transformative social inclusion of migrants and refugees in sport and physical activity. Um, to share with us this work, I'd like to invite Professor Ramon Spy, um, who leads the Sport in Society Research Program in the Institute of Sports, Exercise and Active Living, and also holds a professorial chair in Sociology of Sport at the University of Amsterdam. Um, his work focuses largely on questions of social cohesion, conflict and social change. I'd like to further introduce Dr. Carla Nascimento Luguetti. Carla's research and teaching has focused on topics of sport pedagogy and social justice, and over the last seven years, she's focused on understanding activist approaches within sporting contexts. Specifically, her line of research aims at co-creating a pedagogical model for working with youth from diverse backgrounds. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Brent McDonald, uh, who was a Senior Lecturer and Research Fellow in the Institute for Health and Sport and a member of the Sport, Diversity and Social Change Research Group. Brent's research in the sociology of sport has concentrated on race, migration and identity, specifically contextualised within post-colonial Australian society. So together they will present their work with change makers, 
Um, and at the end, there'll be a bit of a space created to have some conversations and, and, and answer some questions and, and reflect on some thoughts and uh, et cetera. So uh, with that, I will pass it on now to uh, Ramon. Thank you, Rama, for your introduction. Let me share my screen. There we go. Thank you all for, for coming. Uh, personally, this is a really good opportunity to introduce a fairly new research project uh, that we're currently involved in, and it's part of a broader suite of projects around change makers uh, developed and implemented by the Sport and Social Change Living Lab at Victoria University, which is very much a team-based approach. And it's one that I think aligns really well with the excellent work that Sidron have been doing over the years. And we're proud members and, and contributors to Sidron. So uh, I think this is a very appropriate platform for us to, to share some of our current work. Uh, two sort of key features, three, I think, key features to, 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 to what we want to present today. First of all, this is very much a team-based approach. So we'll have at least uh, the three of us present, uh, maybe even more as Najut uh, has made her way in. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge Dr. Fiona McLaughlin, who uh, is very much a co-founder of, and, and you know, uh, 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 one of the, the sort of the geniuses around, uh, behind, together with Brent, the Changemakers concept. And Brent will later on explain a bit more in detail the methodology of, of, of uh, 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 change makers and what it tries to do in terms of sustainable sort of and systemic change. I also want to acknowledge, and I'll, I'll do that in more detail later, uh, some of our uh, partners, community-based partners who are here in the audience today. And I also invite them in the discussion time to, uh, to give their perspective really and share their experiences as well. So I think that's another key feature here is, is that it's not just team-based in the academic space, but I think what we really try to do is uh, a piece of sort of collaborative, co-designed, uh, uh, translational work uh, where uh, uh, we all work together really to try to have an impact in, in Melbourne's West uh, towards positive change for greater uh, social inclusion. And I'll, I'll start with that really that uh, the mission of Changemakers and Changemakers as a project, but also as a broader program of work, and Brent will give some examples from, from Changemakers work uh, we've been doing around gender equity in football, uh, is to drive systemic and sustainable change toward transformative inclusion of migrants and refugees in sport and physical activity spaces in Melbourne's West. Now there's some big words there, systemic, sustainable, transformative, that will sort of unpack and we'll, we'll really try to show them in really tangible ways of how we uh, 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 interpret those and, and, and what sort of practical strategies or actions we, we're putting in place to work towards them. But I think the bottom line here is when we talk about transformative inclusion is away from this sense of inclusion as fitting into or sort of assimilation if that's right, to actually thinking about how can we co-create and, and transform traditional sporting spaces of cultures that have often been quite exclusionary, yeah? And uh, that tend to be quite normative and not necessarily meeting the needs or aspirations of uh, newcomers and also sometimes portraying uh, newly arrived refugees and migrants as almost as problems or from a deficit perspective rather than a strength-based approach. So these are some of the, 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 the I think, assumptions that we're, that we're operating from. Uh, so ultimately, I think the, the, the big why is here is, is that we want to change the culture of sports clubs and also informal sports groups, and we might talk about that a little bit as well, uh, so that migrants and refugees have better participation opportunities, can experience a greater sense of inclusion and belonging. And when we talk about participation, uh, we don't just talk about, I think I've got that somewhere later on, we don't just talk about playing, right, but we actually also very cognizant of the underrepresentations of, of migrants and refugees in decision making, in positions of power in sports clubs. So think about club committees for those who are familiar with sort of club lands, but also in volunteering. And so uh, 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 that, that beyond the participation, so we're trying to also have a broader sort of uh, uh, definition, if you like, of what participation actually means, uh, because we're well aware that, that certain uh, 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 population groups might be overrepresented in participation, but actually under, as in the playing, but they're actually grossly underrepresented and therefore uh, uh, invisible, if you like, in, for example, leadership structures, which also 
uh, has a big impact, we know from international research on uh, 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 aspirations, really, and really feeling there's this glass ceiling where they don't see those, those opportunities to move, for example, into coaching or management or leadership positions beyond simply being considered good players. And uh, a lot of Brent's work, work historically has also gone into that. So this idea of, of, of being gifted at playing, but not actually necessarily fit for leading. And we're trying to sort of really uh, help change that, that discourse. So the, what are sort of the challenges that, that, that got us to start thinking about, okay, how can we do things differently, which is essentially what change makers are trying to do. Because uh, for years there have been the initiatives trying to engage uh, 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 newcomers to Melbourne's West in, in sport and physical activity with sort of varying levels of success. Uh, first is that the participation rates in sport and physical activity are already low in Melbourne's West generally. And I've, I've given here an example of, of Brimbank uh, uh, within the Victorian context. But that particularly newly arrived migrants and refugees are strongly underrepresented and, and experiencing some really persistent sort of barriers uh, uh, around cost and transport, but also really unfamiliarity with, with sports environments and opportunities. Uh, uh, experience sort of exclusion or discrimination in, in, in sport environments uh, and a perceived lack of sort of support, uh, particularly also for girls and women's participation. So really sort of across the, the social ecological spectrum, we kind of see there uh, uh, some barriers uh, uh, that we, we, we actively try to sort of transform and, 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 and work at through, through the Change Makers Project. So what is the Change Makers Project? So uh, we were lucky enough to uh, uh, establish a consortium approach where we're working in the context of this particular project with Volunteer West, Welcome in Australia, Brimbank City Council, uh, Wind and Basketball, and then the spin-off that uh, uh, Youth Change Makers that Carla will, will talk about uh, with football empowerment and some of our broader work uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier with Football Victoria. And collectively, as a consortium, we were able to leverage uh, two years of funding for this work uh, from the uh, Federal Department of Health. And that has sort of been, been a catalyst to, uh, uh, to really now uh, move forward with a broader suite of change makers work around so gender equity, but also around some inclusion of migrants and refugees in, in, in Melbourne's West, more specifically, particularly place based. Uh, so that is, that is kind of where, where that's set. And what, what we're doing in terms of the objectives is ultimately we're trying to create a community of practice. And that, that is kind of based on uh, an ARC linkage project that uh, I led at Victoria University, that one of the things we concluded, and this was around diversity and inclusion in community sport, uh, is that uh, often the kind of uh, diversity inclusion work, or let's call it sort of the, the change agents were what we call individual kind of champions or individual volunteers within clubs. And so A, wasn't sustainable, but also wasn't institutionally kind of embedded. Yeah, so there was a work of single individuals who might leave, experience burnout or have, you know, changing priorities in their lives. And then often that kind of work would fall by the wayside. And so one of the things we found in that project that there was a real demand for what horizontal learning and sharing for, for, for learning from from other clubs of how they might do things differently and to almost create a space where they could be helped to kind of try new things and also to demystify some of the things that seem too hard or, or too daunting uh, because we don't want to get things wrong or we, we don't have the resources to actually create a community of practice where there is sort of ongoing sustained collaborative action uh, 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 as part of a cohort. In this project, that will be a cohort of, uh, of 60 change makers across four waves, and Brent will, will give some tangible examples, uh, who we will work with, who are trained, mentored, and supported to design, implement, and evaluate their own projects uh, that are specific to the needs of their particular sporting context. And that might play out, uh, in fact, in, 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 and Brent will give some examples of that later, uh, one of the exciting things is that we kind of really don't know where that's going to go. Uh, and uh, it's very open-ended. So in some clubs that we've had interest from, for example, they might be interested in doing something with uh, uh, migrants with a disability. For others, it might be more around girls and women with, with migrant or refugee backgrounds. And really so particular to where the club is at and where they feel they can do better 
to uh, provide for the community in, in sort of meaningful and, 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 and appropriate ways. Uh, and as I said earlier, beyond participation as playing, it is also very much about enhancing the representation of migrants and refugees in decision making and in volunteering uh, in local sports clubs. And there are likely to be some clubs who want to particularly focus on that aspect, for example. So uh, you might not be able to read all this. I'm not sure how big you are. I don't know if anyone's on a phone, <laughs> that will be difficult. But this is kind of what, what we went through a month sort of to come up with a, sort of a program logic uh, together with the stakeholders and, and try to sort of co-create. So, okay, what is kind of our theory of change? What, what, are, what are we trying to do and, and how are we trying to uh, uh, achieve these outcomes? And I've talked a little bit about some of the activities uh, uh, where we deliver guided workshops uh, on inclusive sports programming, also on, on conducting social and needs analysis of the club environments, doing, uh, and, and Brent, I think, has some specific examples there, almost a 360 degree sort of critical analysis of the, the current situation that the club is in and using that as a basis for starting making uh, plans towards, towards change. Uh, educating and training mentors. Uh, we have uh, capacity for uh, 12 equity scholars, equity scholarships to be awarded, particularly to low SES and primary carers who want to join us as change makers. Uh, so essentially from 60 different sporting clubs or groups, uh, uh, we try to engage uh, a change maker. So it's a total of 60 and each of them will, will uh, develop and, and implement sort of a, an inclusion project in their own space. So this is kind of the idea of a ripple effect that we bring them in, we work on an ongoing basis uh, in a mentoring training capacity with them. Uh, and then they will implement things in their own sporting context and thereby creating opportunities for a larger number of people. So you can see here that, that idea of the, the, the ripple effect, uh, which, is, which is kind of an underlying sort of philosophy that we have. Uh, so ultimately what we, where we want that to lead is to increase improved community capacity to design, deliver and evaluate uh, 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 sort of transformative inclusion in sport, increased adoption of best practice. So informed really by, uh, by evidence, by research and also by professional experience that our partners bring from the stakeholders I've, I've mentioned and an increased range of flexible community-based participation opportunities. So which where we can also see that, that, that for clubs, this means changing what they do, right? So this is kind of the more the, the two-way kind of uh, learning process where uh, uh, new opportunities are created in, in dialogue and through this uh, sort of sustained engagement in, in, in change makers. Uh, and in the longer term, as I said, so the goals there is, is, is are not just about increasing uh, participation of migrants and refugees in sport, which is of course what the Department of Health would like to see our, the, our funders, but also an increased sense of belonging. So for, for us, I guess it's less about the quantity, right? The increasing the quantity of participation, but about the quality. So an increased sense of belonging, uh, but also an increased representation in decision-making and volunteering. So actually where uh, migrants and refugees have also a greater say in how sport is delivered and how it is organized and how it is practiced in ways that are both meaningful and, and culturally appropriate. Uh, uh, with uh, hopefully attendance of health and social benefits. So I will leave it there for now and I'll hand over to Brent. And Brent, I will stop sharing my screen so you can, uh, you have full control. Thanks, Ramon. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Here we go. Um, and we've got the PowerPoint back up. There we go. So uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, just briefly um, is to give an explanation of the methodology for the change makers framework. Um, and really the methodology actually uh, sort of emerged from um, teaching. So it has a real, uh, it has its origins in units of uh, study that uh, both Fiona and I have been teaching uh, at VU, in my case, for 13, 14 years. Uh, and what we found was that in the sports space, as we go through all the literature about um, uh, uh, issues of, of participation and issues of power and uh, inequity 
uh, marginalisation, racialization, and these sorts of issues that occur in sports spaces, um, we find that the research tends to repeat itself every every five years. Uh, there's not a great change occurring in those spaces. And so we started to design um, uh, assessment tasks for students that tried to get them to critically engage with their own sport and physical activity space uh, from a kind of critical sociological perspective. And we tried to give them some methods to, to use that would give them a better idea or see their space in a different light and then get them to come up with some solutions. A really simple package. And what we found was this was actually quite powerful for, for a lot of our students um, who believed that their spaces were inclusive in whatever way. Uh, but actually, once they did some critical research, they found actually, no, they're not very inclusive because of X, Y, and Z. And so this was a, 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 you know, a contained unit of study. But through discussion, uh, Fiona and I kind of started to think about how do we take the teaching into the public and work in community sports spaces. So we're working from a proviso that most every person I've ever met in a community sports club believes that sport should be for everyone and uh, they believe in equality and diversity and these sorts of things. So this is their, their, their sort of um, belief position and they think that they do that. And so what we try to do is work with uh, these, um, these, uh, these, these sports spaces to try to actually give them the capacity to achieve the things that they think they want to achieve. And so rather than talk about Changemakers West today, I want to talk very briefly about Changemakers um, Football Victoria project, which the reason why is because we've actually done it. And so I can give you a really clear uh, sort of summary of, of how this process works. Now, just to give you the background of the context, Football Victoria put in their annual report two years ago that by 2027, they wanted to achieve 50-50 um, gender equity in the sport. Now, that very unusual statement to see in a sport uh, space, and particularly considering that at the time that they made that statement, they're actually about 20%, 80%. So they're way off 50-50 to start with in terms of male and female participation. So it's heavily masculinised space at all levels, um, and but their goal is 2027, we want 50-50. So... We'll, I'll just explain how this has worked with Football Victoria and then it's all about understanding what you want to achieve and then working from there to how do we support uh, sustainable change in those sorts of spaces. Um, so, so first off, as, as Ramon said, it's about establishing a, um, a community of practice. And so I'll just share with you... Uh, So, for example, with Football Victoria, uh, we managed to get a small grant from uh, the Change Our Game um, program at, uh, the, in the, the Victorian state government. And that allowed us to, to run uh, this first Change Makers project with um, Football Victoria clubs. And so what happened was clubs were asked to nominate uh, a person from their club to come along to work in the program and help uh, develop strategies or whatever to achieve the 50-50 goal. And so we start off with something like this. So we develop a community of practice and we get our, our people, for example, you know, kind of get it, it's kind of nice looking at these people because we know them so well because we spent so much time working with them. Um, but, you know, we get them to write a bio to start with, a buy-in uh, statement, an affirmation of why this is important to them. And each person's perspective and background is different. At the same time, each club space is geographically different. It might be at a different level. Indigenous. Highly elite. With some, with some prompting questions. So, uh, yeah, we've got some highly elite spaces. We've got junior clubs. We've got different spaces uh, around, the, uh, uh, around the sport. But you can see here someone like Rad Miller, who's amazing and did some amazing work, is coming along to be part of this and she writes a bio of why she's interested in, in being involved, her engagement with it, 
and, and what that might look like. So that's our first thing is to develop that community of practice and we can see some bios here um, and, and this sort of um, building a, a collective. So that's our, our first step along the way. Now, once we have um, our, our collective, our buy-in, um, we go through an, an exercise. So all of this occurred during COVID. Uh, we managed to run this program entirely during COVID, uh, during, during the, the horrendous second lockdown. Um, and we actually found that Zoom was in this situation very useful because it allowed us to create community practice from people in Sale, in Albury, Wodonga, in Ballarat, and in Altona. Uh, so we could get this amazing cross-section of football clubs involved. So then the first thing we do is we, we, we go through what's called an extinction exercise. Again, this is something I do, we do in class. Extinction exercises essentially, your goal is to achieve 50-50. Okay, so therefore, what we want you to do is we want you to think about and give us the conditions required to get to zero 100. So let's go the opposite direction. So in this situation, uh, because we're based on women and girls in this particular study, how do we get, make sure that there are no women or girls involved in football at all in, by 2027? So we flip it around and we get people to think about the conditions that would be required to achieve this, all right? And this, maybe some of you have dealt with this methodology before. It's not particularly uh, unique. We didn't invent it. I got it from an environmental um, workshop. Uh, so it was about um, climate change and uh, sustainability of the Asian elephant. Okay, so we, we go through this, this, um, this process of getting our participants to design an extinction criteria for the, for the condition that they're trying to solve. So that in this case, um, women and girls. Okay, and then from there, we develop climates. And I'm just gonna show you what they look like. Um, now the climates is based on the work of Pat Griffin. Pat Griffin um, is a professor from the United States who spent most of her career working on uh, GLBTI uh, inclusion in, in organizations, in, particularly in university and college sports in, in the United States. And Griffin came up with the idea of climate. So her, her concept of climates was that there were hostile climates, there were conditionally tolerant climates, and there were inclusive and supportive climates. And she came up with these criteria for what would be a hostile climate, what would be a, a conditionally tolerant climate, and what would be an open and inclusive climate. And so based on our particular goal, which is 50-50, well, let's see what we do. So this is a huge, this is, so what we do is we co-create with our participants. The extinction exercise essentially gives us what would be hostile, okay? And because we know the research, we kind of guide them into thinking about three different criteria. In the case of this one, we think about the theme of access, we think about the theme of representation and we think about the theme of experiences. So essentially we get our participants to design and what you see on the screen here, it's eight pages of climates designed by our participants. Okay, and so you can see, for example, um, as I uh, move down the page, if we think about, um, here we go, um, female coaches. So a hostile climate would be with no female coaches at any level. And then conditionally tolerant, there's a few female coaches, but only at the junior space. And then the uh, supportive and inclusive climate would be 50-50. And so once we design this process and we, we do it across, um, we can do it with our representation. So representation would include things like um, uh, the numbers in terms of participation. It might have something to do with things like wages. It might have to do with qualifications. Uh, we can, and this is all designed by our participants, mind you. So they've come up with these um, criteria and it might have to do with other aspects. And finally, we have their experiences and we can see here they design these things. So for example, attitudes to females, general club attitudes. And we've got the hostile climate at the top, 
conditionally tolerant and in inclusive and supportive. So once we've co-created this with our change makers, we then move to the, the next step. And I'll just quickly get you through to that one because I know we're time poor. So then we get them to perform an audit of their club. And in particular, this means how do you audit your club? Well, you need methods. And we therefore do a methods workshop where we uh, uh, move through a range of methods that you could use to know your club in a different way than what you know at this point in time. Um, and importantly, this is where our mentors become really important. So the, the Change Makers program is about mentorship as well. So in the case of Football Victoria, we have um, about 10 uh, uh, mentors, mostly who are students at Victoria University who have shown a real interest in gender equity. And so we say, okay, they learn the methodology and then we assign them to clubs to help get the evidence. Okay, and so then this would look something like this, um, where we have our criteria and we get the clubs to basically go through the criteria and say, okay, in relation to this uh, registration methods, uh, where does your club fit? Um, and then we make sure they have to have evidence to back this up. And that's, like I said, where our mentors help get that evidence. Now that might be um, us, our mentors providing a, an analysis of their social media. It might be co-creating a survey to give to members. Uh, it might be going on site and, uh, and, and being at game day and listening for the language that's on the sidelines. Uh, it might be running a focus group with senior women at the club. A range of methods that we would use in any sociological sort of research project that we actually provide as a support to these people. Realising that they probably don't have the time or the expertise to do it themselves, but if we do it with them and we provide that expertise, we have greater capacity for achieving these things. So you can see here, <laughs> our clubs have to do a fairly strong audit. Now, some of these will not be relevant to every club, so they can just put not relevant. And some of them, they won't be able to know the answer. But the key thing is we produce this, and this is something that all of our change makers that you saw on the screen before have gone through and done. So they've come to empirically know their space in a way that they didn't know beforehand, and often with enormous surprises that they weren't expecting. Now, the important thing is this is not just a deficit approach. We're also looking for inclusive and supportive. This is a really important thing. Many clubs have lots of uh, uh, criteria that would be in the inclusive and supportive space. But an action might be required there, as we can see here, to maintain that. What, ha what is the strategy to maintain these things? So we, we work along, we say there's priority and we think about possible strategies, which is where the last part of the methodology comes in. And we design strategies. Again, this is the co-creation working together in, our, in our, our Zoom groups. We go into our breakout rooms, usually about five clubs per room, and we work through the evidence to co-create a strategy based on a theory of change model, um, which looks a bit like this, where we really systematically work through understanding the activities that might be required, the inputs, the external factors that might be in place. And we create, co-create those strategies. And we encourage those clubs then to attempt to implement some of these strategies. And we continue to support them through those implementations. So the whole idea is, did the strategy work? And so that's a measurable thing that we look to uh, 2022, 2023 to maintain connection with our change makers um, to ensure that we have a, a good sense of, um, of, of the success or, or not of, of these strategies. So in a nutshell, that's the method. Now, when we look at Changemakers West, we can adapt this method to whatever these clubs are wanting to achieve. 
So obviously the 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 um, the statement is the inclusion of uh, uh, recently arrived migrants and refugees within Melbourne's West within these sport clubs. But as Ramon, Ramon said, this might involve different forms of intersectionality. It might inf involve, um, for example, women and girls, like Ramon said uh, uh, before, or um, older people, or uh, ability disability, however that might work. And so following this same method, we can then co-create, design, evaluate, and then work to uh, changing those spaces that become part of a sustainable change. And the key thing with the sustainability is the support that we provide uh, through, through the process. So this ongoing support is really important. Um, last thing to suggest is that the community of practices, the design is about creating solidarity between clubs and sharing knowledge. Usually what happens when any sort of change thing occurs in sports spaces is clubs compete with each other to get a funding to try to do something. And so in competing with each other, one club does well and gets to build a new change rooms and three other clubs don't get a new change room. And so then what happens is whatever change happens, people move to the, the club that's successful and the other clubs then cease or struggle to, to survive. And we see often what would we describe as cannibalization through these processes of change. So that's why we're trying to build this solidarity and collective sharing of ideas which has been quite successful, like I said, with this Football Victoria model that we've run. And we've now come through three cohorts, uh, 50 odd people and 50 odd clubs. And we've seen, at least now they're at this position of implementing strategies. Some have already been done uh, and we'll be able to evaluate those down the track to see how those things have, have progressed. So I guess that's all from me, Ramon. I'll go back to sharing to you and uh, there's the method. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Carla. Carla will present and she will, Carla will explain this far more eloquently than me. Uh, Carla will present on Youth Change Makers, which is a sub project of the Change Makers uh, Melbourne's West that I sort of presented on. And I think Najut is joining her as well. I think they're co presenting, which is great. So, Carla, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ramon. Thanks, Brent, as well. So today I will be presenting the Youth Change Makers Project. Uh, and Naoji, Naoji is a research assistant in this project, so she'll be presenting with me. Uh, my intentions today is describe the research and some of the results that we have until now. It is important to mention that the Youth Change Makers apply the same vision and the concept of the change makers. So the concept of cultivating a community of practice with co-participants. So as Brent and uh, Ramon mentioned, this sustainable change. However, what we want to do as well is including uh, young people's voices. Next slide, Ramon, please. So it's important to mention that the Youth Change Makers project builds on our previous studies in this organization called Football Empowerment based in the West. In 2019, we developed a six-month participatory action research where we worked with a group of 30 African-Australian young women and five coaches as co-researchers. And we identify barriers that they face in that sport program, and we implement actions based on their voices. Next one, please. Uh, so this project results in a few publications that you can all access, and we learn a lot from this pilot. First, we learn uh, the power of African-Australian refugee background coaches working with African-Australian refugee young people in a community-based approach. And second, the unique perspective of having youth as co-participants to creating the conditions to naming, critiquing and transforming the barriers that they face. What's happened at the end of this pilot, the participants suggested extending the participatory action research to the younger children in the project. And that's why 
we decide to create the Youth Change Makers project. Next one. So the project is a five month participatory action research and I receive an early career research grant from VU to develop the study. For this project, we have three young women from the previous intervention working as co-researchers. And we also have Naudi. So the study focus on the younger boys, the young boys in the program. Next one, Ramon. So in terms of methodology to listen and responding to young people's voices, we are using a student-centered inquiry's curriculum approach. It is a process of working with young people and it is as well a way we are using as a framework for data collection. We are collecting multiple data sources and for example, field notes, collaborative meetings between myself and the co-researchers, all artifacts that the boys are producing and a final focus groups as well. And next please. And to explain a little bit, you know, what we did until now, I wanna invite Naoji to be on board. Yep, thanks Carla. Um, hi everyone. Nayud, I'll just give a yeah, brief, it'll be pretty brief, but um, so um, with, we spent like seven weeks um, creating, um, yeah, co-creating the research, thinking about our mission, the visions, um, what we want to ask and all that stuff. And also speaking about like what our biases are in terms of what we want to find out um, as well um and so can you go to the next slide yeah so just this slide just speaks about um the co creation of the logic map and the co-design of the methodology um you can look at it and then just the next slide yeah so we spent three weeks um getting to know the boys and um, just doing the building, the foundation of getting to know them, what football meant to them. Um, so we had a session plan the first week, but then the first day, and then when we went to um, go and actually go do it, we're like, no, this, we need to spend time actually getting to know the young people and just looking at the environment before we ask any anything of them. Um, so, yeah, so then what they said in those building the foundation phase is that um, they spoke about what the impact of football in their lives. So people have said that um, they use it as an escape, um, helps them stay out of trouble, um, it gives them joy and pleasure, and it also brings people together um, and the social aspects of playing football. Um, and we also asked if um, what, the, what they wanted to change about football um, they just said like corruption in football, so and in fees, so like the broader sense of football. Um, they also said change in racism and more representation. So they spoke more about um, seeing more people that were of African backgrounds um, just playing football um, in like the league and stuff as well. Um, someone that people that they can identify with, and more representation. People said also. They wanted more to see more like Indigenous people as well represented in those sports um, and also a more organised football program. So they wanted more, for example, um, sessions of playing, um, variety of um, different times and all that stuff. Um, and then the next, the next um, slide. Um, so we still have um, six weeks to go. Um, to do the digital storytelling um, and to understand the boys' um, lived experience in football. Um, and yeah, we'll be using this, using um, digital storytelling and the activist phase, I think. Um, don't know what that will, you know, um, <laughs> we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> but, um, and then the next slide. 
Um, so challenges um, for us as facilitators were because um, the boys are very passionate about playing sports. And um, so their priorities was playing sports. So it was um, pretty hard navigating that, like saying, oh, can we please get a moment of your time just for a little bit? Um, and also understanding the boys valuing what we're doing. Um, and also we have to, we had to do a lot of um, thinking about the language that we're using um, when we ask um, the young people questions and stuff. Um, and yes, yeah, people mentioned like, why are you using uni words? Like the word ideal um, and all that stuff. And yeah, so we're, yeah, using, you know, imaginative words basically you know and they're practical you know um and um so we had to give like three different types of questions like try to um yeah ask it in three different ways um and also the power relations in place so the competitive nature of the sport um and trying to get the boys to come and sit and chill and just try to um just yeah be a part of that project and um sitting in the sessions and it's usually five we have like five minutes if the other team didn't lose so like or you know usually um and yeah we have weekly debrief meetings and yeah we go back through what our challenges were and go back to session plans and all that good stuff yeah thanks Carla, do you want to leave it there for now, Mayut? Yeah? All right. Yeah, so look, I'll, I'll just round off and then we'll open it up. I know that's a lot of information. What we try to do here is almost give sort of a, a tour of force, sort of a quick sort of uh, overview of some of the different things around this Change Makers banner. So we have the, the, the new sort of uh, uh, ongoing project uh, with newly arrived migrants and refugees in, in Melbourne's West uh, in this consortium approach. Uh, we have, Brent had some fantastic examples, really tangible sort of how this methodology works, uh, building on the work that uh, uh, Brent, Fiona and, and Carla have done uh, uh, with football in particular, around the 50-50 objective. And then from Carla and Ayut, we've uh, heard from the ongoing uh, Youth Change Makers, which is sort of as a, as a sub-project uh, uh, that has this particular sort of methodology working now, particularly with the, with the, the younger the younger children sort of in the program, particularly boys, whereas the first project focused particularly on the girls and the young women. So I guess we'll, we'll leave it there. I also uh, really invite any questions, ideas. I should also say, because these are ongoing projects, we're really keen sort of, if anyone has ideas, feedback, critique, also those from, from, from some of, you know, uh, people in the community and from the different, different uh, uh, local government areas that we work in, please feel free to contact uh, me or one of the other uh, uh, team members. Uh, we really value that. And I also really wanna uh, invite our partners if they have anything to add as well, sort of from their perspective. So but Rama, other than that, I'll let you, uh, I'll, I'll hand that control to you because I realize it's your show now, thank you. No, no, all good, all good, Ramon. Th thank you very much, Ramon, Brent, um, Carla, and Yayud for, for sharing um, some of this yeah, important participatory work. Um, and yes, I'd you know, like to invite um, anybody to, to share some, some questions or, or reflections or thoughts that they, they might have. And, and also maybe, Ramon, if you wanted to share your email address, perhaps in the chat for people, um, if they want to have a grab that. But yes, please, any, any questions or, or comments from folks? I, I, I invite you to, to share. Jack, go for it. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Really love the presentation and um, that's, yeah, awesome work. I'm wondering um, about the role of council or the potential role of council in terms of um, resourcing or facilitating your work at the local level. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit curious about that. Yeah, Jack, I'm happy to respond to that. Uh, so Brimbank City Council are one of our partners and we also have a sort of pretty close working relationship with Wyndham City Council, even though they're not formally partners. Uh, uh, so uh, both Brimbank and, and Wyndham, for example, play, play a role, I think multiple roles 
uh, uh, one is uh, really important roles around the recruitment of the change makers. So councils have a pretty good handle on uh, their sort of clubs and informal sports and physical activity groups in the area. And so for us, they've been an important partner for, with recruitment of the change makers. So identifying clubs that uh, uh, are kind of interested and active in this space, but also clubs that might need a bit of support, clubs that have been a bit of resistance, the whole spectrum, uh, and really trying to get us in, in touch with clubs and sort of what, I I, uh, you know, what's really important, and I think Brent, you might want to comment on this, uh, that was important also lesson from the, the work with, with Football Victoria, is that it's important that clubs really buy into it and so that, that clubs kind of also nominate someone. So in other words, uh, that there is kind of institutional support or some level of commitment, right, to being on this journey. And so councils, I think, are important brokers in that process. Uh, uh, and, and we're going through that, that process now. Uh, but also in the other end, so uh, 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 with sustaining a community of practice, of, of creating opportunities to share. So, for example, there's a uh, inclusive sport and recreation network with various councils where this is where kind of some of the scaling can happen over time as well, uh, or through the Municipal uh, Association of Victoria, where uh, councils sort of also become ambassadors for the project and to be able to share this with councils elsewhere. So it's both sort of, you know, downwards with, with the clubs and the, the informal groups in the area, but also sort of uh, horizontally, vertically sort of uh, 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 aiding in the scaling and the dissemination and translation of, 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 of some of this work. Uh, so, so Brent, I don't know if you want to comment on that in relation to lessons learned, but I think this point of really helping with getting clubs on board and, and committing uh, uh, works a lot better when we when uh, we have councils sort of also as brokers in that process. Yeah, absolutely. Sam, sorry, I didn't see your, your hand raised there. Thank you. That's all right. I only just put my hand up. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It was such an interesting um, and so many amazingly useful and practical, I think, aspects of it. Um, but I'm interested, in, I guess, my questions main, mainly for Brent around the, the, the idea of that audit um, and those sort of indicators and how you see the ongoing relationship between the university and, and the clubs to maintain those audits. And, and the data, and is there an ongoing relationship between you and the, and the collection of, of data? Uh, no, so one of the things we did at the very beginning, we said, it's not our data, it's the club's data. We don't want to own, and it's not, I guess we're working with Football Victoria. So Football Victoria have got a, a, an investment in this idea of being 50-50 uh, um, uh, for whatever reason, and it's it, like, it's very unusual in sports spaces to see any organisation explicitly do a 50-50, especially when they're so far away from it. So this kind of, we can be a little bit sceptical of some of the motivations, but we can go to the clubs and we can say, we'll help, it's your data. If you want to share it with us, we'll, we'll, we'll work with you with it. Uh, it's for you to, to, and so sometimes clubs find things that they're not overly happy with, but also it's theirs. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's not about, we, in fact, in many respects, the research element of this particular project for us is actually trying to understand the complexities of change, as opposed to understanding more barriers or facilitators or any of that stuff. We already know that and not really, it's not for, that's not what we're about. And we're quite clear about that. So if we make a survey, it's their survey. And if they wanna share that data back with us because they want some help uh, interpreting it, then we'll provide that assistance. Um, and I guess, you know, we are committed. You know, I'm, I'm a public servant, Sam. So, you know, I, I have a research allocation and this is what I'm committed to doing for as long as I get a research allocation. So, um, you know, I'm, in, I'm invested in this. And the great thing is we have these students who are so many, particularly young women who come through sport and exercise science are committed to gender equity, but um, have, you know, they are similarly frustrated and they also you know, through this process, they become change makers in their own spaces. So there's, an, there's a multiplier effect through the engagement with stu students who might not come from a football background, they come from another sport, but 
understanding the complexity of, of why change is hard uh, and, and then trying to work out where are the easy wins and where are the long-term ones. And so part of our, our plan is definitely in terms of assisting clubs or assisting, you know, don't go for the, the, the hardest thing first because you're going to hit so much resistance. That's going to be, it'll be catastrophic and it can be really actually really harmful for, for people. Um, so how do we then, strategy is also about, well, how do you step that way? And, you know, we've got 2027 is that goal period. So, you know, in a six year period, how could you provide that ongoing support? Uh, and, and the support is, you know, we, we just need to get, uh, we keep on getting enough funding for the, to, to pay the mentors. So the mentors are all paid. We, it's not about free labor. Classic thing about gender equity is always it relies on free labor. Uh, this is not free labor. All of our mentors, uh, are uh, you know are on an RA or HEP three one or something like that, uh, whatever it is. Uh, so therefore, their work is rewarded, uh, and therefore they they the sustainability comes through the fact that it becomes a job, um, and their job is to help that club, and and they develop really interesting relationships with these people, um, and clubs just love to find someone who's willing to actually support them. Uh, and actually come out. So, you know, I love going out to clubs. <laughs> Get down to training, uh, have a look around, you know, be a face there. The, the, the tangent, so going from Zoom, but actually being in those spaces is really important too. So uh, I guess that's a commitment. And, and like I said, that's my job. So I should do my job, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's great, thanks. <laughs> Now, I'm just conscious of time, but perhaps I've got time for, for one more question or comment if, if there, are, there are any out there. I think I, I I've got one just just quickly in the in the in the last uh, few few minutes that we have together, and I was just perhaps maybe it's for for Nayud and, and Carl. I was just really interested in, um, you know, I think one of the things that Nayud you spoke about was um, a, a challenge around how some of um, the the young boys or, or getting them to see the value of the of the work that we are doing. And I was just interested to sort of hear maybe briefly about. Um, how how some of how some of them might have seen the project and, and and some of the things that you were doing. What are some of the ways that they were seeing that work? Yeah, I, I think I can start now, which and you can help, please. Uh, yeah, so one of the challenges it is because they are there to play. So how can we, you know, stop and listen to them and. We also know that the kids start to value uh, the participation in participatory action research when we start to respond to their voices. So we went there like three weeks. So we know that will take time to them to start to value this process. Uh, I think as a, as a facilitator, we have you know, coaches on board uh, and that's something that's helping us. But I think the whole environment and the competitive environment that is a challenge for us, has been a challenge for us. I think they, they are changing now a little bit, but yes, it is still something that, yeah, we have to keep doing. And I think as, as much as we can, because they, they have lots of things to say, but we have to help them in terms of language because now you was mentioned and I'm learning, you know, what, what kinds of questions should we ask? So we, we spend lots of time in our weekly meetings, planning to the upcoming, you know, data collection with the boys, but sometimes it's work, sometimes it's not. So I think it's a, it's a matter of time and building relationships with them and finding the language. So I'm really excited to see if, you know, using digital technology will help in this process of finding the language. Yeah. Nauj? Um, maybe I'll just quick, quickly add that, like, 
yeah, it's more about building that rapport with the young people and actually them seeing you often as well. And actually, and something I always um, challenged by is like when we are so much of young people, but we don't give like some of ourselves to that young people in the, in the sense that I'm, we're asking them heaps of questions, but they don't know anything about us. So we're like basically intruding into their lives. Um, and so they asked me a question as well. So what are your thoughts on these things? And I was like, oh, um, this, this, this. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, so they also want to ask me questions that we ask them, if that makes sense. Um, so that, that has been helping a bit. Um, what else? Yeah, I think that's more so than anything, us being them being able to ask us the same, like similar questions and find out more about us and what our research would do. Um, and it's, yeah, improvement of what things you want to see. Um, is there an immediate thing? It might not be, because there are structural stuff as well. So it's like they see that, but don't really, if that makes sense. So it's like, can't name it, but it, they, they have an experience of it. So it's also using that language to help them navigate that. Um, so yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah. Awesome, thank you. And again, I'd like uh, to invite everyone to join me in thanking thanking you all and, and the other people that, that haven't spoken today that have been working alongside you um, through this project and, and collaborating as well. Um, thank you, yeah, thank you very much for, for sharing. Um, and just a reminder as well, I think Ramon shared uh, his email in the chat uh, as well for people that are wanting to, to connect and contact. Um, and I'm just going to share as well the website for Sidron um, so folks can keep an eye out for some more seminars and some more of the work that we're doing across the, uh, the network. Thank you. Thanks, Ramon.